I just want to start by saying this is the best room in any room in the United States today. <laughs> So yesterday, when Tim Palmer from the Democracy Work Institute was introducing us, he said, "You know, I really focus on, on like the, the industry focus and that." And he mentioned, like, kind of offhandedly, like, and the home care work is the farthest along of any other, like, sort of worker co-op sector that's working together to sort of on a you know systemic way and in, in a coordinated way to change the the world and change the world. And that is 100% true, right? We are doing something that is not happening anywhere else in any other sector. And that is a, a shame, but we are the leaders in that space, right? So you guys are that leadership. And this is just, like, feel that for me. Because it's really, really, really important. What we're doing today, what, we're, what we've been doing, and what we're going to get, you know, do tomorrow together is really critical and important because this work, home care, is incredibly important work. And it is work that is undervalued, is systematically underinvested by our society, by our government, right? And that is a shame, and that should be a crime. But we are fighting against it. And it's hard, but we're doing it. So just like own for a minute that you got it, like, we, this is like where the beginning of change is. So like, feel good about it. Like I, I, I just want to let you know, like, I, I spent a lot of time working with co-ops, and this is the best for me. So thank you. <laughs> now I'm going to throw a lot of data at you. <laughs> um, so I want to talk a little bit about, just about sort of the national overview of the home care market, just to give sort of a broad, broad context of, of where we're at. The thing that we really want to do, that I really want to do today, is, is provide a framework um, for how to think about the home care market, how to think about your, the market that you're operating in, right? And so sometimes this is um, the, um, it, 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 it's, whether you're in a startup or whether you're in an operating business, it's just understanding the market that you, that you live in and operate in. Um, and so what we've kind of come up with in, in, in terms of the work that we've done in the last year um, uh, for CDF is sort of try to identify um, what are those sort of key metrics, the key things you want to think about, right? The, the challenge, though, that I think we want to always recognize, right, is that the data will only get you so far. The analysis will only get you so far. So we did a, um, a, a market study um, a number of years ago for a, um, a, a cleaning co-op co -op group in, in the Boston, Boston area. And we did this whole analysis of where are the, you know, what are the cities that have progressive, you know, po progressive population that would be interested in green cleaning and would be interested in hiring a co-op, and what is the market opportunity there, and, and how do you sort of think about the whole map, where, where's the right place to go, right? Well, this was a co-op mostly of undocumented workers. And we laid out like sort of where all this, the, the states or all the best towns and best places were on this map. And we said, well, you know, you really should think about this area and this area and this area. And what they said was they said, well, we don't want to go here. Because this road, the cops pull you over and we're going to get deported. This road, this is a safe road. So this is our market. There's no way for me, as an analyst, there's no way for some you know, person sitting at a desk to know what is on the ground and what's real. So, it's, oh, so we, I feel data is really critical and is really important, but it is meaningless unless, until, until it hits the road, like the reality. And the reality of like what's going on in your local market, that you've got, no one else has that. Right? And we're especially, we're unique in our sort of, you know, in the cooperative structure because it's not like it's the management who has it, it's everybody has it, and we should build structures so that that local knowledge is being fed up um, and, you know, sort of that communication is going up and down so that we can be the best businesses we can be, right? Um, so I'm going to talk a lot about, like, the broad data stuff, but know that, like, 
all of this stuff could be right, but once it hits the reality of what's going on in your market, it could change, right? And that your knowledge, that local knowledge, is really critical. Uh, so it's a combination, I think, is, is, is what we need to think about. So as we think about the home care industry generally, um, what we see is that there's just a huge growth in the number of people, um, the elderly population in the United States. Right? So by 2030, we expect 71 million, and that's 71.5 million people um, 65 or older. 87% of those folks um, want an aging home. Right? They want to live at home. They want home care to be the way that they you know, access services. Now, we live in a world where we don't guarantee the payment of home care. Right? We guarantee the payment if you're sick and for a nursing home bed. We don't guarantee a home care bed. But this is what people are, our home care. We, but this is what people want, right? And so there's going to be a huge push and huge demand. Like, if we think things are, you know, like the, the trajectory that we've seen for the last five years, it's going to get bigger, 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 bigger. Right? So that's the trend that we're going to see from going forward. Um, home care is one of the top 10 fastest growing industries in the United States, right? So part of the reason that we're, um, uh, you know, that, that there's such an interest in home care cooperatives from like the whole world is because this is a lot of, you know, there's just a lot of this activity happening. And we think that the cooperative structure that puts the caregiver at the center of the owner, you know, at the center of that business, that's the right model to approach. But you can sort of see that the number of people over the next um, number of years the number of, um, that, you know, that just the industry is going to grow, 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 grow significantly, right? So that presents an opportunity as home care businesses, of both as startups and as operating businesses, there's a huge opportunity for that. There are big challenges, right? And we're going to talk a lot more about challenges, but there's a, a big opportunity in terms of the growth of the business. Um, the challenge is for home care workers, right, for the caregivers, the job is we've decided as a society to devalue this job. We've decided that <coughs> we are not going to put money and energy into sort of making this job, um, like the, the material side of it, match what, what the job really is, right? So you've got an average wage of 1070. You've got almost the majority of folks um, who are home care workers accessing public assistance. 18% um, are uninsured, which is a big, you know, actually a, a good number in the sense of um, uh, an uninsured is just access to, to insurance. 40% um, of home care workers are on Medicaid, right? So Medicaid is the biggest payer, but 40% of home care workers are actually accessing Medicaid um, because the home care workers tend to be, um, as we know, right, a lot of you know, the average age of home care workers. Um, uh, you know, it's it's a, it's a it's an older it's an older uh, group of workers, um, and there's not really the support from like sort of a regulatory standpoint in terms of you know supporting supporting that work. So what we're doing right is we're really st like fighting against this tide of a lot of like you know real challenges and real problems that are that are that are hitting the um, hitting the business right. Um, this last piece that 67% of work, uh, caregivers work part time is a really critical one, right? So one of the things that the cooperative structure can do, and we look at sort of you know the, what um, cooperative home care associates, one of the things that like the really shining examples of what they do that's really exciting is they're a Medicaid funded agency, so the state sets the wage really, right? But what they can do is they can organize their work so that as many people as can are guaranteed a certain number of hours. Right? So you can't fix the wage necessarily, but you can fix earnings. Right? And we can organize ourselves in that way. And I think those are kind of best practices and some interesting things that we can probably try to learn or learn from each other. So how do we think about the market assessment? So really, and I'm going to go through all of these things in some detail, but there are really sort of five, three key categories to consider, five things that we want to think about. Right? So one is client demographics. And the second is labor supply. And those two things go together, right? So client demographics are how many people in your community um, need services, right? Labor supply is how many workers are there to meet that, right? And so those two things are really critical to understand 
where your mark, how your, like how, how difficult is it really to meet the demand um, in your in your community? So when we look at that, these are kind of the key questions. So we look and say, okay, for the client demographics, it's and this is the you know so some of the um, I don't know if, if folks have seen it, but we've done um, a series of reports on different states that look kind of go into some detail around some of these things. So if you're in New York, Texas, New Mexico, North Carolina, West Virginia, Minnesota, Washington, Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania. Um, there's a there's a study that sort of goes into the into this detail. But this really is to try to give you a sense of like how to think about your your you know your market. Um, so we look at sort of how many people in your community need care, right? That's a key thing. And then there's a question. How many workers are there that might need them, that are there to provide care, right? And that relationship is really critical. So we're going to sort of talk a lot about in, and this is, I think, something that people really should need sort of search. It's a, if you're going to understand one math equation today, right? This is the one, right? Um, it's the ratio of people who need care to people who are available to provide care, right? And that's going to really tell you what is the opportunity or what is the challenge that you face in sort of uh, recruiting people as a business, right? Um, and how competitive is that? So what you do is you take the number of people, the elderly population, which is about so frail elders, about twenty percent of the senior population. You add it to the people who are um, eight, you know, eighteen to sixty-five um, who have a disability. That's the number of like people who need care in a community. And you take that and you divide that by the number of workers, which is the number of home health aides, the number of personal care aides, and the portion of nursing assistants, CNAs, that are in the home care field, right? So when you take that, what you find is that nationally, across the United States, there are eight people who need care for every one person who's willing to provide that care, right? So, if you're trying, so who has trouble finding these people? Who has trouble finding clients? Okay, in New Mexico, right? So that doesn't necessarily surprise me. But in a lot of places, the real cha the, the challenge is not finding clients, right? The problem is not finding people who are, who are interested in getting the care, the problem is finding people who can provide that care, right? And it varies across the country in significant ways, right? We're gonna talk a little bit about that. Um, but this is a really, when we talk about kind of the, um, the caregiver crisis, right? And that's, there's a lot of talk about the caregiver crisis. That's really what we're talking about, right? Is that as the, as the population increases, right? As the senior and the disabled population increases over time, <laughs> the number of people who are available to take care of them, it becomes increasingly competitive. So you get situations like in Philadelphia where competitors to home care associates of Philadelphia are standing outside where the workers get their checks, trying to steal them away, saying, don't, don't, don't go work there, come work for me, come work for me, come work for me, right? Um, so uh, I don't know if, if, if you know, over the last year, Jonathan Ward from ICA staff has worked with the folks at Cooperative Care in Wisconsin um, to really try to, you know, figure out how to solve some of these recruitment problems. And it's a huge problem, right? Um, and we'll talk about kind of where this is. So if you look at the, the national average, that's that eight to one is where that the, the national average was. So if you're in Minnesota, Minnesota is the lowest as the sort of the best the ratio, right? So a little around three to one. So there's three people who need care for every one caregiver in Minnesota, right? Um, Florida, you're at 23, right? So thankfully nobody here is from Florida. <laughs> we'd have to like rush them to the hospital. <laughs> um, maybe it calls you up from Florida and might say, well, you know. <laughs> there are other businesses that you can get into. Um, so it's a real, you know, it's just a real, like, it, but there's a, there's a huge, huge difference, right? 
Um, the problem is, is that the, I'm going to talk a little bit about cooperative care. So cooperative, um, cooperative care, where they are, um, they're right at the national average, right? So what does that mean? What is, how does the national average feel? It sucks. It sucks. <laughs> <laughs> right. So if it sucks, <laughs> this is not the place you want to be, right? This is not where we want to be. So it's, it's not, and it's not impossible, right? There are solutions around this, right? Um, the solutions, the solutions to sort of dealing with some of these things, and this is some of the stuff that cooperative care is doing, is, um, so they are pretty much a, 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 a you know, heavily, heavily, heavily Medicaid agency. Medicaid rates are really low, right? So the wages are correspondingly like low, right? Because the wages are so low. So one of the ways you can shift that is to focus on a different market, right? And so for startups, right? So if you're a startup and you're thinking, we're going to build a relationship with the state and go Medicaid, and that's how we're going to do it. I want you to say, don't do it. Don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> because it's a real, it is a real challenge right now, right? Um, it might, you might be able to make it work. And each each market is unique and different, right? <laughs> but the difference is, if you can, if you can access a private pay market, right, then your ability to pay a higher wage and attract people is is greater, right? Um, and so there's all sorts of local, you know, local conditions that impact this. Um, but if we look at Home Care Associates of Philadelphia, right? So Home Care Associates, they're a little bit above six. Still sucks for them, right? So nobody's here from them right here, right? <laughs> no, we can't have <laughs> But it sucks, right? It's not good, right? It's still hard at six. CHCA in the Bronx is, is pretty good at four, right? And I think one of the things that's interesting and this is, I think, sort of, this is not the only metric, right? But that difference between, you know, HCA and CHCA, right, is, I think, an important one. Because CHCA does not have a huge problem with recruitment, right? That is not the defining challenge that they face, right? Um, and so part of that is, part of that is the number. And part of that is, CHCA has a really, really sophisticated and, and robust training and recruitment program, right? And so how much of it is because of that? And how much of it is because of the ratio is, is difficult? And then there's all these other you know, sort of competing factors, which is um, sort of the number of, people, the number of, of immigrants, right? So the, 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 the home care workers in the United States tend to be like the, the, the new home care workers tend to be immigrants, right? So what's the immigrant, you know, sort of the inflow of new people into Wachoma County over the last five years? I mean, you don't know the actual answer, but let's say just a raw guess. Uh, very minimal. Very minimal, right? So these, these are factors that have, you know, so even if the, even if the, the caregiver ratio is, is, you know, was, was high, if you had a sort of a big, influx of people coming into the community who have sort of caregiving as part of, you know, something like this is a, a, a profession that they're, that they're attracted to, that they like, this is a, a way to do it. So each market is like slightly different, right? But then you've also just got the scale of the agency, right? So the best way to get people is to somebody who works, who's a member of your co-op to say, my co-op is the greatest place to work. Come work with me. That's where you know that's that's how we get the, the best folks. If you're 2,000 employees, 1,400 members, and five or 10 percent of people are saying that, you got more people coming in the door. If you're 45 people and five percent of people are saying that, you've got fewer you know you've got fewer people coming in the door, right? Because of that. So that we're sort of referral component is really critical. Um, obviously, there are other issues there in terms of pay, benefits, guaranteed hours. Um, one of the things that we want to spend some more time, sort of, um, with the home care co-ops over the over the course of the next year, is understanding what are the factors that that, that <coughs> interplay in this, um, and, and how and how we can sort of use those to um, sort of guide um, some some strategic decisions. 
right? Because we can't just say, oh, well, rural Wisconsin, sorry, right? Like, that's not a good answer. We have to figure out how to solve that problem, right? And continue to solve it, right? Because that problem exists in hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of counties around the country that need a home care co-op as well, right? So it's, it's our obligation to try to solve that problem. But it's also, so this is a, so this is a key thing that we need to be thinking about. Um, and you can sort of see across the country there's huge, you know, there's wide variation. So this is at the state level, right? Um, but at the, um, uh, you can sort of see like in the south, right, the um, Appalachian in the south, there's some real, you know, those are the, those are the, the most sort of challenging places. Um, and if, you know, but if you're in Colorado, you're doing good. Minnesota, New York, these are good, like these are sort of easier places. The, this data is, so I'm gonna offer up Nick. Nick can stand up. <laughs> <laughs> Nick is the guy, right? So we have this data at all, at the sort of the county level. So if, if you wanna understand what's going on in your, um, you know, your local market, we can help you identify this data, right? Um, and Nick is the guy who does that. Um, and Nick is the guy who made all the facts. Um, so the other key question is how, oh yeah. I have a question about the ratio. Is there an ideal, if one over one, like, you know, one caregiver for one um, patient, is that ideal for a successful co-op? Or is it just the lower it gets, the better? Like the I think it's just the lower it gets, the easier it is to attract workers into the field. Um, so one of the things we didn't do that would be an interesting question is what um, uh, I mean one of the one of the challenges when you look at and we'll talk about turnover a little bit as well one of the challenges is that the you know turnover is increasing in the industry and that plays into the you know to, into these issues because people are moving in and out of the field right and that changes the number of people in that um, uh, the number of potential workers right in that field over time. Um, so there's a lot of, of sort of complicating, you know, complicating factors, and the ratios were probably better 10 years ago because, or they definitely were better 10 years ago because the aging population was smaller, right? Um, and, but it was also the case that the number of potential workers was higher because the unemployment rate was much higher, right? So one of the things that we're facing right now, one of the things that's like going, you know, that is a challenge for hiring workers, but it's a good thing in terms of, like, you know, for workers, like that. that in, in a lot of places, unemployment rate is, is, is relatively low, and so people have options, right? Because if they can, they can quit a lousy job and go to a different, like slightly less lousy job, hopefully. Um, and that gives, you know, that gives people sort of more power in the workplace as well. Tom? One thing I'm not following about this uh, caregiver ratio is if you have, like Florida, with 25, isn't that an opportunity-rich environment? Isn't that more potential customers for your co-op and the ability to be more selective about the clients you do take? If you can find the people, so if you're in Florida and you've got 45 people who are committed and you're a good organizer and you've got that group of people, absolutely 100% yes. The problem is um, not the number of clients, it's the number of workers available to serve them. Right. So it's, if, yeah, so if you're, if you, if you, if you are an organization, so if you're a community-based organization in Florida that is, um, you know, made up of people who are interested in, in, in being a caregiver and are looking at, at, at doing that, then you've got a huge market opportunity in Florida. The problem is if you're, if you've got 20 people, right, and who are doing that, and you need to get to 50 people to be at the revenue level where you're stable, or 45 people or 40 people to be at the revenue level that you're stable, finding that, you know, going from that 25 to 40 can be a, an enormous challenge because people are, you know, being offered signing bonuses, people are being offered, like, you know, um, all sorts of, of incentives to quit, right? And so some people say, you know, I'm not interested, you know, yes, I want to be part of this co-op, but I also want that $500, right? Because I need $500. Um, and so it's, those become really difficult challenges. Understood, thank you very much. 
Um, I was just going to add on to the question about what is a good ratio, one to one or one to two. It's really difficult to say because obviously the needs really range and some clients need full-time care and others just need a few hours every week. And so really once you get down to the agency level, it's, it's a ratio of client hours to caregivers and if you're trying to provide full-time care, how many hours do you need to provide that amount of work to the worker? So, so the, the caregiver ratio gives you a sense of how difficult it would be to recruit and you know what, what's the opportunity for your agency broadly, but then once you get to that level of granularity, it's really about the client hours. That's it. Thank you. Yeah. So could she do a lot of the thinking with me? Um, so. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the other next question is like, where, 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 you know, who's going to pay for the services, right? Um, and so one of the things that we want to look at, right, when you're thinking about opening up um, or or thinking about what you know, either opening up or expanding um, or you know, sort of shifting your work is. Sort of what are the opportunities for different payer sources, right? Um, so we looked at this and sort of built out the, these metrics, but it's really a question of what is the Medicaid rate, what are the opportunities in that, and what is the you know what is the private pay opportunity, right? Um, and you know, in short, if you are in a community with a lot of people who are in between Medicaid and being able to afford private pay home care. Right, that that presents a real challenge. So I believe this is I mean, this one. Here. So this is a Nash a map, a map that nationally looks at the annual cost of home care as a percentage of state median income, which means in let's choose Montana because it's dark and easy. So in Montana, <laughs> the average cost to provide home care for a, um, a you know year's worth of home care in the private pay market is 100% of the median income for people in Montana, right? So all you need to do is take all the money you own you get, and pay it to a home care agency and then you can, you can, take, you know, you can take care of your, you know, your, your family, right? Um, and when you look at the, you, if you look at this map as a percentage of the income of people who are 65 and older, right? So you're paying, people are paying for it themselves, those numbers are, are starkly different. So on a national level, the average cost, an annual cost of home care is 119% of the median income of somebody who's 65 and old, right? So it's, there are some people, right, that's median. So there's, you know, there's a lot of people who can afford home care, right? Um, but if you live in a community that has a lot of middle income people or has a, um, you know, doesn't have a, 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 a enough uh, people who can afford to private pay, you're in a real, you know, you're in a real bond, right? And so understanding who in your, you know, what is the de demographics of your community is really critical. Um, the other piece there, though, is because it's so expensive, Medicaid, the federal government, right, um, or federal and state government, they they represent the um, the lion's share of of the, of the money that goes into the system. Right. So yesterday we had, um, and we're gonna, you know, at some point we're gonna have to have this sort of we, where, where this becomes a broader thing where it's the technical assistance providers and the home care costs together figuring this out. So yesterday there was when um, during the training there was a strategy session here talking about how to grow the home care sector. Medicaid, they're the folks who set the wages for home care workers, right? So it's the the, you know, the Health and Human Services, the federal government, and the state government, the state, you know, state um, Health and Human Services, state health, the Department of Health, through the Medicaid system, they set the wage for home care workers, right? So in, no matter where you are, right, pretty much the home care wage is gonna sit in and around what the, you know, what the state sets that pay at. Right? So if we want to change that, we need to sort of target Medicaid, and we need to target state and federal governments um, uh, to do that. And while I said this is the best room to be in, this is not a big enough room to do that. So we need to make this room bigger. Right? Um, and so that's part of what we need to do. Um, 
But if you look at the, the issue of um, sort of you know Medicaid as a payer, you know the, the, the reimbursement rates are very you know very low across the country, right? And so it, if you're operating at um, you know it's just very different. If you're getting paid eighteen dollars an hour from the state to pay a worker a, 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 a you know reasonable wage is, is is incredibly incredibly difficult, right? Even if you're the most efficient sort of lean operation in the world. Right, it's it's incredibly difficult to, to do that. Um, so it's just like Medicaid presents a real challenge, right? And so that's why because the last year, you know, they, and that has shifted, right? Over time, it used to be, you know, it used to in some places it was better, and in some places it was worse. But there's a you know there's a shift around that. Um, so um, so the other piece, so peninsula home care, um, and these I hope these numbers are right, um, uh, but they're. You know, sort of like a focus on sort of private pay, right? So, how long has Peninsula been operational? About eighteen months. About eighteen months, and right? And we're already over. Two already months. over, right? So, Peninsula is a new, you know, eighteen month, um, eighteen month old um, home care co-op with a pretty much exclusive focus, one hundred percent exclusive focus on private pay, right? Um, and because of their market, right? Because they are in a place that. Um, you know that that facilitates this. They've really been able to grow. And so I was talking to folks uh, the other day, like the recruitment prop. You know, the recruitment is not the challenge that you have, right? Um, and so in certain markets, that you know these things are you know they are they are different, right? So depending on where you are, trying to figure out um, you know what the what the right market is. But private pay presents a real opportunity, and that's true if you look at the um, you know the the the. the um, the market overall. So this is the number of these are the top ten um, franchise opportunities um, in the United States, right? From Forbes magazine, and four of the top ten are home care companies, right? So twelve years ago, zero of the top ten home care uh, uh, fr franchise opportunities um, in the United States were were home care. Today. Four of the top ten um, are, are home care, right? And these franchises, as folks, as, as folks may not know, but, they, but it is generally true, um, the franchise operations almost exclude, have an almost exclusive focus on private pay, right? So eventually, they move. You know, some some franchises eventually move into into public pay as they grow. But from us, from a um, from a, an initial standpoint, it's really a focus on private pay. Yeah. Uh, did you go back to the map or uh, the diagram where you have the pay before oh. that? If this was to demonstrate what the private pay amount of money versus mm -hmm. Medicaid, would that be a reverse then? Not just in dollars and, you know, in terms of what is spent on home care. Yes. So only, yes. So, yes. 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 Exactly. Just, I'm just, uh, yes, this absolutely. just shows what percentage pays home care, but it doesn't say in dollars. How much would be, it would be reversed? Is that dollars? Is that, is, yeah. No, so it is the way you're thinking about it. That most of the money is coming. Most of the money is still coming from the public. Yeah. From Medicaid. So if you look at the whole, if you look at the industry overall, all of the home care industry, right? 70% of the, 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 of the revenue that home care, the home care industry gets, the, the, the revenue source is Medicaid or public pay. Um, so Most set, franchises don't, don't, that's why I'm confused. They're all after that small. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah that they're seems, all on that. Yeah, part. that seems that they're making money just in that small. Uh, yeah, that's exactly yeah. it. Yep. That's exactly it. So, so, so there's all there's a lot of talk, right? So if you follow home care in the news, you'll hear about like all oh, this investment in technology, um, and you know how we're going to disrupt the industry with the like, Uber for home care, right? Well, first of all, like. They're, they're, you know, most of those folks are just as bad, if not worse, than Uber. So they're not our friends usually. But, um, but the, all of that stuff is focusing on this, this market, right? So n almost, almost none of the technology, the folks who are focused on technology, none of the private equity money, right, that is, um, is going into home care. Virtually none of the kind of like the. The new investment into this industry is going into that seventy percent, right? Because if you're an investor and you want to get a twenty percent return, and you're getting paid, 
$18 an hour, like there's no way to get, you know, to get that 20% return. It's, it's, you know, it's, it's essentially, it's impossible to make that, those kinds of returns um, with the focus on Medicaid. So that, so, so the, like, so where that sort of activity is happening, it's almost all in that private pay world. Um, so, yeah. If you're using median income to estimate the dollars available that the household can pay on the private pay, I'm not getting the 119 percent. I mean, you look at the median income for the um, population. What do, what are you looking for, and what does it say? So, so this is just saying this is just giving a, 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 a general metric of how expensive private pay home care is compared to what people earn. Right. So it's just saying if you were to, if you take the average cost of. Yeah, I thought that. But yeah. if you're trying to, you know, you're using the demographics to determine um, what, it, whether whether private pay is something that a startup could could use. What would you look for? What what kind of um, median income? Or how, what would you look at? Oh, you would look at so good. Yes, you would want to have that number be. The lower that number is, the more sort of the more opportunities that would exist within that market. But is right? there a certain median income that you're looking for, or a percent of median income that can be devoted to home care? Is there a ratio that you're looking for? I don't. I don't know if I. Ha I, I don't think we have that measure. I don't know what that measure is. I'm looking at, at folks. If, 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 um, if anybody knows that, I don't know what that number is. I, mean, I think it also varies widely beyond what the. Um, uh, the, you know, within within a community, right? So within a state, so that the cost of California, cost of living is higher than it is in, in certain places. So you'd have to look at the California, the average cost in California compared to the um, uh, to the median income in California. So you want to, you know, and this is looking at a national level compared to. So in California, that number might be actually significantly higher um, uh, because the cost of care might be higher in California. So the other thing, just to follow up to that, I was wondering, is median income the best way to measure for seniors? Because a lot of seniors have alternative ways right. of, uh, of generating income and have more assets and that kind of thing. So it's, it's not in terms of understanding kind of at the sort of actual market level what the right, like what the real opportunity is, but it is in the sense that it's the only measure that we have that we can compare across like at that. It's the only national data that we can have to be able to, um, that we can sort of aggregate at the county level. So, so there's limits in terms of, the, of what that data is. But if, so if, so this is really, so this measure is really, if you're looking at like, okay, I can choose this county or this county, right? And it's a way to measure like between those two choices, right? Or if you're looking and saying, we're looking at Northern California versus Southern California or whatever that measure is, it would be a way to say, all right, I'm going to tend towards this place because it's likely better. But then as you start thinking about within that region where you want to focus on, then you're going to want to start figuring out other measures of, that are more likely about like, what are the actual number of people. Um, because it's, so to point to the and care again, one of the interesting opportunities is there's, um, you know, if you look at the median income, right, it's not, you know, um, it's not great, but they don't need, like you know, hundreds and hundreds of people were doing that for the private pay to sort of push them over the edge, right? The the number of, of clients that they need is, is not that great. So it's like it's like oh well, there's a lot of you know, it's just like there there is that opportunity that exists here, um, and so let's figure out how to how, how to engage with it. Um, so at the local level, it's like this data kind of becomes less relevant, and it's more like where do the rich people go, <coughs> and how do we access? Yeah. Does this number include people who pay not for a regular home care license the agency as opposed to they hire the neighbor's uh, housekeeper to come in? And, you know, there's a lot of that. Yeah, so that's one of the challenges with this and app, with this data is that there's a, a there's a big gray market. Yes. Right. Um, and so the so a lot of that data is is yeah, um, yeah. is is not part of it because it's just not measurable um, in you know systemic way. I'm wondering, you know, like what you're saying, you know, it's like really about looking at where the rich people is going, right? But like in terms of recruitment, also the workers, uh, they're going to be part of this cooperative. Um, I'm wondering in other industries, like for example, California, where I industries like service, uh, cleaning services, uh, the workers are actually moving away from those uh, geographic locations. 
because they can't afford to live right. in those counties anymore. So I'm wondering, you know, like, what is like, you know, the opportunity for a cooperative um, where, yeah, in terms of recruitment, you know, how that's going to be affected, uh, whether the workers can actually afford to live in those counties or not. Right, so in, in rural counties, it's, you're relying, or in, in you know, less dense and populated areas, that you're, you're relying on cars to, to, to address that issue, and you are often going to be having folks move them from one, you know, where, where they live to, to, um, uh, it, uh, to, to where, the, where the clients live. Um, and uh, I would say, you know, interestingly, you know, that the, where, where, something, where some of those kinds of things happen is, um, you know, cooperative home care associates, when they try to, um, looked at, at Brooklyn as a market, right? Um, there, you know, it's it's not that far on a map, but having tried to go from the Bronx to Brooklyn, like it's pretty far, right? In reality, um, those you know those like those challenges, those kind of challenges present themselves in a you know in an urban area. So those are, those are those are meaningful and difficult issues. And so when you're thinking about, especially in an urban place, how you're going to Sort of effectively engage with the community, recruit. That is, an, you know, putting a lot of thought into into you know building those partnerships, building those connections. Um, you know, one of the one of the things we talked about yesterday on the strategy was identifying who, who key partners were, and one of the key partners was immigrant advocacy groups and immigrant right groups, um, because if you know if that's if that's where sort of workers are, you know, if that's where sort of the base of, of, of potential workers are in in in, in, in your community. Figuring out to say, look, you know, this is an interesting, exciting opportunity for folks, and it's like, you know, like the value alignment is really high. So. Yeah. Just to add on to this, like when you think about Medicaid or heavily Medicaid agencies versus private pay agencies, everybody has trouble with travel time and figuring out how to match a client to a worker and move them around, especially if they're going between more than one client in a day, you know, et cetera. Um, but it is something that can be a little easier on the Medicaid side because of this issue. Like, mm -hmm. Workers are low income, clients are often low income, they tend to live closer to each other um, than when you have that income yeah. disparity. Right. Yeah, that's good. Um, so then the other key thing is your competitors. Right? And usually when we do an analysis, this is kind of where we start, right? Is um, is who you know? Who are you? Who are you competing with? How is how easy is that? Um, so generally, the home care industry is incredibly, incredibly, incredibly fragmented, right? So nationally, the top three companies control 8.7 percent of the market, right? But when you look at like 82 percent of home care businesses are are independent businesses meaning that they have less than, you know, you know, usually like it's one or two locations, right? So the vast, vast, vast majority of home care companies are independent businesses like, like home care clubs are, right? They are, you know, that, that's who's sort of our market. But if you look at the difference here, right? So look at the folks in New Mexico, one of the challenges is New Mexico actually has an incredibly concentrated and, um, uh, um, sector. So, 41% of the market is controlled by the top five home care firms. And Ambercare, which is the biggest home care company in New Mexico, controls like 18 or 20, I mean a significant portion, right? So they're, they're one player is a big, um, is a big um, um, operator in there, right? Um, I will know Ambercare is somebody who we might want to think about inviting to this group because it is, turns out, employee owned through ESOP, right? Um, so the question of like how do we, you know, are they are they folks that we should be engaging with? And are those, you know, is there an opportunity to engage with, with folks like employee owned um, stock the employee stock ownership plan companies, which are employee owned in a different way? Um, contrast that with West Virginia, where the top five firms only control 14%, right? And so what this really means, right, is if you're in West Virginia. All your competitors are tiny. They're going to look a lot. They're going to look and feel a lot like you are, right? As a startup in New Mexico, many, many, many of your competitors are going to be tiny, like like a startup, right? But some 
a few are big, 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 you know, folks. And so this is just a difficult, you know, just as, you, as you're thinking about your local market, right, how competitive is it? Because if you're a, you know, if you're a, um, if you're looking at private pay, right, and your competitors are big, chances are they've got people who have the relationships with the hospitals and with the systems to, you know, to, to get those connections, and you're competing with that, and that's a challenge, right? So the more, just, you know, let them, the more sort of consolidated the market is, the more challenging it is. Um, and then finally, sort of just these issues of, of barriers to entry. How hard is it to open up a home care company, right? So folks from North Carolina are here. The problem is there's a moratorium, right? The state of North Carolina is not going to issue any new licenses to home care agencies, right? So. The big challenge is how do you how do you get a license to be able to operate, right? And so there's a lot of states will have a certificate of need process, um, and that what that means is that the state will sort of any time you know even if you were to buy a license from somebody, the state will have to approve that. Um, but if you want to get a new license, the state has to approve that, right? Um, and some will say, oh well, that's good because it makes sure that you know only reputable people are in there. Um, but if you're a startup, it's a real problem, right? Um, the you know we, we looked at um, at Texas. One of the challenges in Texas is if you could sell you know you, you can't get a new license, but you could buy a license, right? Um, but it was a very very open question whether or not the state would approve um, you know would sort of allow that license to you know the, the, the new entity to operate under that license, right? So there's just like there are these kinds of challenges um, presented, and so as you're looking in your state, as you're looking at what you're doing. These barriers to entry are going to make it less or easy, you know, easier or harder to get in. The nice thing about barriers to entry is once you overcome them, everybody else is stuck behind them, right? So it's not a, it's a barrier to entry isn't a reason not to do something, but it is a reason to sort of be thoughtful about how you do it. So David, just quickly yeah. to clarify, that moratorium is on certified home health agencies, certificate of need. In term, but meaning Medicare or you know combined with Medicaid, or are you also saying for any, even at a personal care assistance level, it's a moratorium. I think it's just for Medicaid. Right, Medicaid, yeah, so the Medicare level in terms of certified home health agencies that can draw down money from Medicare as well as Medicaid. Is that where the it's, moratorium? It's is? Medicaid and Medicare, but at the certified. But level. at the certified. Got it. Yeah. Okay. So coming back to these sort of five things, right? So these are measures, right, that folks should be thinking about as you know, as you're as you're growing, as you're thinking about the strategy, right? What we want folks to be doing is to be thoughtful and understanding about their market, right? And to be um, sort of the more you know about your market, the better the, the better you're going to be able to navigate. And these are not the only things that you need to know, right? There's a longer list. Um, but these are some of the sort of the key things. Um, and as folks are, 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 are doing this, right, one of the sort of one of the goals that we have is to help, you know, is to provide the sort of the right kind of support to help people understand this stuff, right? So if you look at this and say, it's over my head, I can't do it, I can't do it, I can't do it. Fortunately, we have um, uh, Leslie and the Cooperative Development Foundation has, um, you know, has gotten um, funds to help us, you know, sort of navigate that stuff. So we can help you sort of do that. Um, and if, um, uh, you know, and, and, and I'm going to point to Diane and the, um, uh, and Deborah from the um, Northwest Cooperative Development Center as well. Like these are folks who have a real kind of keen understanding of how to, you know, how to navigate um, a lot of these these kinds of issues. Um, so these are kind of the, you know, sort of for us in terms of the key takeaways in the industry, right? These are kind of the big things, sort of, you know, a summary of most of the key things I just said. We can make this PowerPoint available for folks, so you don't need to write all this stuff down. Um, but it presents challenges, right? I just want to sort of stress, like, this is a real challenge. Um, and the big, the big challenge is that recruitment. So 
This is, this is data from Home Care Pulse, um, which is a, 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 survey, um, uh, a survey company that looks at, um, at the home care industry. Um, and so when you look at sort of where COVID <coughs> comes from, you can sort of see the number one issue, the number one place for recruiting folks is, um, is your current employees referrals, right? Um, and when you look at the interesting, the, some of the interesting piece around this is that they, they measure how much it costs to acquire a new worker, right? Which is sort of a gross term, but that's what they use. Um, so this is the how much does it cost to, to recruit somebody into your into your business, right? And um, usually the like the employee referral program is a bonus system for, for, for employees. That's why it's generally high. But the you know the cost of recruiting from your you know from a, a an, an internal referral is generally the most expensive. But if you look at the turnover for people who are recruited from these different ways, you could see that the turnover rate for folks who are internal referrals or, or referrals from, from other workers, that turnover rate for those is significantly different, right? So when we think about like where we where we recruit from, right, and how we do that, like not not every source is, is 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 equal, right? Now each you know this is on average for the whole industry or for the people who participated in the survey. Um, so your you know your market could be different, but the difference between you know, this number I think is a really um, you know is a really critical one where if folks are coming to you because of an internal referral, like those folks are more likely to stick around, right? And that's one of the big challenges that 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 you know every home care company faces, right? Um, the other thing, and this was um, this was one of these things where we just was like a little shocking, which is um, the number one reason that caregivers choose to work for a place is because it's the first place they looked. <laughs> like that's where they looked, um, and so it's one of those situations where. The, for, for us, the key takeaway here is um, like you've got to be out there, right? So we're talking about marketing you know, later today, but a big piece of this is like we've got to be out there, right? We need to be in the places that home care workers are looking because that's how we're going to get them. Um, the other key thing, and I think this is sort of like delving into some of the stuff we're going to talk about later, so I'm just going to highlight it quickly, is that um, you know, thinking about sort of, you know, relationships, right? Relationships are really critical for recruiting workers, right? So figuring out the, the places where workers are and how you can connect to them, that's a really critical piece. Um, the other piece I just want to sort of highlight is something that we didn't, you know, this is kind of a, 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 a kind of a tangent to where we're at, but something that I think folks need to be thinking about is, is thinking about different, you know, different um, sort of a diversification of, of revenue, right? So um, if you're struggling, if you're having a challenge, there may be other ways, you know, other sort of lines of business, other things that you could sell that could sort of diversify um, your, your revenue, right? And so we should always be open to that, open to that. Um, so I believe that is where I'm gonna end.